saying that we have one, I could be more celebratory if people actually knew what was in it or people actually bothered to use it. And that's a big part of the problem, right? And so today we're gonna unpack one part of what's going on in our government under the constitution in particular section three, I'm sorry, um, article three section, one about the Supreme Court in the Constitution. Uh, the first early Supreme Court began meeting in the 1790s. In fact, there were even scandals and corruption and people getting kicked off the courts only five years into its history. Maybe we'll hear some more about that. We're here today, of course, to review some of that history. Uh, and the title of today's presentation is Supreme Injustice, Social Justice and the Supreme Court. So um, that implies by the title, uh, that just because people slip on black robes doesn't mean they're automatically devoid of conflicts of interest, doesn't mean they don't have biases, and doesn't mean they don't have ideological directives that guide their behaviors and their decision-making process. A whole lot of the rest of it is designed to kind of, well, these are impartial people. They're supposed to be objective and fair. Well, maybe the court is about as objective and fair as our news media. And that's, of course, where you can start laughing, uh, sad, sadly or uncomfortably, um, because journalists are also supposed to be impartial or objective or not let themselves get in the way of the telling of the story. But look, we all do to some degree or another. The best we can do is be transparent about these things. The best we can do is call each other uh, out in a way that allows us to understand when we're maybe not living up to our best practices and principles. And today, I think that's the spirit of what we're talking about with the Supreme Court. The extraordinary power it has generationally in our society, historically. And of course, we have some things that the court deals with that are of course <clears throat> controversial and over time, we have seen the court change. It changes with its members. Remember, members of the court are appointed by presidents who are very ideological, right? And that means that the whole process of selecting these people has bias built into it. But yet we're told repeatedly that, no, these are completely objective observer observers and, and so on. Well, look, today's discussion is going to clearly illustrate that there are many different perspectives about the court, many different perspectives about the cases and the issues that they deal with. And guess what? Consequences. So some of the things that our esteemed guests are going to be talking about today are areas where the court maybe hasn't worked so much to uphold rights as restrict them or take them away or move them from one demographic to another. That's all part of the perspective. Perhaps sometimes you agree with that. Perhaps sometimes you don't. So we will hear today, several of our guests are going to be talking about where they see significant issues, challenges, and maybe even go so far as to say that some elements or some rulings and some people on the court maybe don't always have our best interests in mind. And maybe we're not heading in a direction that uh, really exemplifies some of the higher principles ensconced in our founding documents, which were written by terribly flawed people, right? As great as we want to say some of them are or were, they also had deep flaws. 40% of the founders were slave owners, for starters, right? I mean, we could go down the long list. We won't. But I think today you're going to get to hear a lot of very fascinating uh, perspectives and arguments about things that are happening on the Supreme Court now that affect people here and now in this room even. And that's, that's something that we should embrace. We should not take it lightly, but we should take this information and move it forward in ways that might be able to, well, the court is one of the hardest parts of our government to attenuate, right? People are appointed for life. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so you get a person on there in their 40s and you might be hanging out with them for a couple generations. May not sound fair, may not sound equitable, may not be democratic. It's not, but it is what it is. So we should try to understand it better, understand what goes into it, and understand more deeply that decisions that these nine justices make do affect millions upon millions upon millions of people. Sometimes for the better, sometimes not. And we should be very careful when it's not and we should be very mindful of people that are being left out or cast aside from the promises of things like the Bill of Rights. So with that, I'm going to let our guests now speak. I believe, Sangha, you had a statement that you wanted to, mm -hmm. to read and introduce to people. And then we're going to go through Sangha, Albert, James, and then I'll wrap things up somehow quickly with a quick spiel on corruption in the court and conflicts of interest. And as ever, we'll open it up to all of you wonderful folks for your input, questioning, comments, critiques, and so on. So thanks again so much for being here.
thanks so much, Mickey. I'm just so excited to see a full room. This hasn't happened in the Diablo room in a long while. So thank you all for being here. I know some of you were required to be here, but anyhow, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, it's really exciting to present with my colleagues here. We hope this will be interactive, informal. It's just a panel of your professors. I know you're tired of hearing from us all the time, <laughs> but we'll keep it short. We do want to have a Q&A towards the end. My name is Sangha Niyogi. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I teach sociology here, and I co-direct the social justice program with my brother, Dr. Albert Ponce from Political Science. Let's see, we launched our transferable degree program in 2018. Of course, there was a pandemic in the middle, but <laughs> we've been going strong. We sincerely believe that social justice education has the potential to empower communities to resist and disrupt oppressive power structures and work for solidarity. Community engagement is at the heart of our program. We are an interdisciplinary course um, program. So we have intro to social justice as our core class. We team teach it. So we have faculty from political science, sociology, history, journalism, who teach different sections of the intro to social justice. For community engagement, we partner with our local organizations and we have a community advisory board. I want to also offer my special thanks to our colleague from early childhood education, Juan Huerta, who always helps us with tech issues whenever we ask him. So I look forward to talking with you more during our panel presentation. For now, I will hand it over to Dr. Ponce. Thank you. Welcome everybody. It is great to see a packed space. We're, we're not just saying that. this is amazing. We do this all for you so we can all learn collectively. And on this day, you know, I'm just going to begin by reflecting on, on the space that we're in, right? And it's where I want to begin to think about the constitution and who the preamble of the constitution, who we, the people are. I'm always asking and pressing everybody walk around, ask yourself, who are we the people that preamble those words and that lay out uh, the entryway to us thinking about this document that continues to bind us from 1787 to 2023 and its impact upon us. So um, I also just wanna mention a couple events that will be happening as we hope to fill in for every event, part of our social justice speaker series. One of the things that I wanna begin with on October 10th, we at DBC will be celebrating, commemorating Indigenous Peoples Day. This is the other side of the Constitution. The Constitution, a, a, a day that is not supposed to be remembered, that we're supposed to move on from in the building of this document. But we will honor that. We will do it officially with Dr. Vanessa Esquivel, alongside with uh, Dr. Danny Cornejo and Ethnic Studies. We'll be hosting an event here. We're hoping everybody's back. Also, and it'll be at the same, same time, and on October 23rd, we will have Professor of Ethnic Studies, Christian Weiss, here at 4 p.m. And November 20th, we will have Shawnee Shea coming from UC Berkeley, uh, talking about building the, abolishing the, prison, the school to prison pipeline and how we build bridges from incarceration into college. And this is very important to us here as we welcome everybody back and we're really trying to build those pathways for us all to really engage with each other, build community, continue that commitment to, to higher education and the mission to for all of you and all of us to transform our lives. Because when we, we do that, we're all, we're all in this together, right? So we keep pushing forward. So as we're thinking about going back to this concept here, these words, we the people, I want to think about the constitution and the articles of confederation, which was the first constitution of the United States. Before it, it sought to build a new world one in which a narrow view of humanity would, would shape power relations well into the present. For them, the promises of freedom were unlimited. It was a brand new world. But for those who did not fit this criteria, their limited freedom 
led to what Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls premature death. So I'll be taking on contemporary cases of affirmative action that deal with higher education and access and opportunity for us in these spaces. <clears throat> but I want us to think about what affirmative action is. It's that policy, the practice of favoring individuals belonging to groups who were historically discriminated, or those brave new settlers who came into the space. Their grievance was the act with not having the access to land, but the land was there for the taking, which they took, including here, the space we're on at BBC. So I want us to think about the Constitution, not only as a document that is lived and interpreted to its contemporary environment, but how it began to shape the domination and the erasure of certain specific populations. If they weren't completely eliminated, this solidified their legal exclusion. And that's why we have these levels of contestation. So the Supreme Court, as Professor Huff clearly mentioned, has always been ideological. It has always been political, never objective. And we'll be talking about that some more at the end. From the first uh, Chief Justice John Marshall Court, who ruled the court for 34 years as a federalist, really imposed his bias into the federal domain. So these white settler grievances for the lack of power and land established this legal framework that we're commemorating. And it also legalized the theft the actual material theft, taking of the land. And also to think about our present, I wanna jump from that moment, 1787 to today. And what I wanna think through is a framework of what I, what, um, many scholars call racial capitalism, the way that race has shaped capitalism as we see it today. And race has been the central attribute that has been dis that has distributed resources, land, opportunity, <laughs> wealth, life expectancy that we were just discussing into the present. So this framework allows us to see how that racialized hard hierarchy that we see today, the ruling the, as the ruling classes in the United States seek to further enrich themselves and their shed, shareholders. They seek to maintain the conditions of coloniality. And by coloniality, beginning from that moment, we mean the long standing systems of power and domination that per pervade until the present over those racialized populations, indigenous, enslaved Africans, and all people of color who are further incorporated into the present. So, this is the, the class dimension alongside the racialized dimension and the gender dimension, because those 55 individuals who sat down and ratified. This document were of a specific race, of a specific gender, and of a specific class. And that's what we're going to think about how they created the rules, an affirmative action program, as we say, for themselves and their brethren. The term comes into popular parlance, especially in the early 1960s, and begins to take shape from there. So the Supreme Court of the United States and affirmative action, pushing back on that initial, initial affirm, what I call and coin affirmative action within the Constitution for white landowning men. They created the world for themselves and a specific program on how to continue to build and accumulate that power. But affirmative action for us, as we're thinking about to trace the history Discussions in the post-World War II moment, where now populations are coming back after serving in that conflict, that global conflict, began to make claims, demands of inclusion, access to the university, access to the library that, was, that they were banned from. So these conversations begin as early as President Eisenhower's term, John F. Kennedy, the discussing plans, but it wasn't implemented until Richard Nixon, go figure. Seen as a staunch conservative, Richard Nixon creates what was termed the Philadelphia Plan, a small federally uh, run plan to give access to minority owned businesses in the construction realm. From there, we see the big legal case dealing here, not far away where many of you are transferring to, the University of California at Davis, in the famous Bakke 
versus UC Regents case of 1978, where multiple myriad of plans, people are trying to readdress the, the historical exclusion of these populations. How do we grant access? We've denied them for so long. Multiple plans are out there. UC Berkeley, I mean, UC Davis Medical School says we will allocate 16 spots for these racialized disadvantaged groups. Baki was a white male, was denied entry twice, applied twice. Uh, they went to court, to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court issued two rulings here. One ruling was racial quotas are illegal. UC Davis, you cannot have racial quotas. The Supreme Court ruled in 1978 that racial quotas are illegal. How many people in this room believe racial quotas exist today? Be honest. Many. When I ask students in my class, I get almost unanimity. Ruled illegal in 1978, but the pervasiveness of diversity in spaces where they didn't challenges our, co our cognitive abilities to understand the world, right? Or produces cognitive dissonance. So, but what they upheld now the victory for those who are trying to be included, racial group out racial groups are outcast, but race can be a factor in determining your admission because race was the variable, if you think about that determined your life's access to opportunity, whether it was the house, the, the neighborhood, the redlining housing covenants we just came from discussing in class to uh, being steered to certain areas. So race is, is, is a precedent in your university application. Now this is challenged in 2003 in the university admission case, cases in Gruder and Gratz. And in these two cases, a very slim majority, it was a, a conservative majority on a 5-4 vote, said, yeah, there's some issues, but race is, they upheld Baki. This is challenged again in 2012 and in 2015 in the Fisher v. University of Texas case where Abigail Fisher, university, the University of Texas system has a top 10% plan, understanding that schools are very unequal. If you, as long as you made it in your top 10%, you will be granted admission to the University of Texas. Abigail Fisher went to a high performing high school, wasn't in her 10%, didn't, got denied. She uh, took it to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court conservative majority still said, yeah, race is a factor. Now we come to the students for fair admissions versus Harvard this year. It was just ruled on in June and the University of North Carolina. And I wanna put, so the emphasis here, thank you, New York Times, not really, but thank you for highlighting some of the, the majority opinions by Justice Clarence Thomas and Chief Justice John Roberts. And I just wanna draw our attention to you with the Chief Justice John Roberts says that these admission programs using race as a factor, as one of many, cannot be reconciled with guarantees of the Equal Protection Clause found in the 14th Amendment, one of the Civil War amendments. But rather striking is this last sentence, that we have never permitted admission programs to work in that way, and we will not do so today. We have never admitted, permitted admission programs. As we're thinking about, as I, the way I began this conversation, the Constitution was a preferential admission program for everything, for one identity. And race was the mitigating factor. White landowning males, not their wives. White landowning males, not the poor whites working. So the class dimension of these gentlemen. So it was the structure. And this just highlights the erasure of a history that's unbeknownst to Chief Justice John Roberts or the unwillingness to see that as being as the building of the nation state. So in the dissenting opinions, Chief Justice, uh, I mean, Justice so Sonia Sotomayor and Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson issued a scathing critique of the majority opinion and what that would lead to. So again, Brown Jackson's, what this does, it actually demanded that this perverse a historical Chief Justice Roberts reading and counterproductive outcome. 
Sonia Sotomayor ended with, despite the court's unjustified exercise of power, the opinion today will serve only to highlight the court's own impotence in the face of America, whose cries for equality resound. These cries for equality were amplified after the televised murder of George Floyd in 2020, the summer of 2020. People came out, but again, people stood up. One thing we always know when people want to make a change and you stand up for what you believe is right, there is a force on the opposite end attempting to push back on that. And that is what the court has done to many of the progressive measures that were gained through the struggle on the streets, in the courtrooms during the civil rights movement in the 1960s and 1970s. Immediately, there was a pushback. That pushback continues. And I will just want to point to, I will close by stating one, there is one figure that is prominent in all these rulings. One conservative activist, Edward Blum, B-L-U-M. And as we're thinking about the ways that affirmative action programs in education are going to permeate every aspect of society. So now this is, becomes a legal precedent for a resegregation of eliminating race the, the, and really building in this colorblindness where we don't see color. Everybody has equal access when you miss the entire structure and the policies and the practices. And this is what Judge Corker here, in this case, on the, this was a specific business program that was laid out for, again, minority-owned businesses to get loans. And it was, again, once the Harvard case was decided, people jumped on this, and the judge wrote, the facts in the student for fair admissions incorporated concerned college admissions programs, but its reasoning is not limited to just those programs, <clears throat> telling us, signaling society, every aspect where race becomes a factor to evaluate anything is up is fair game. But we're setting the legal precedent in the, this federal uh, district court. There's Edward Blum, who financed not only the Michigan cases that we went over, also the Texas cases, and also the Harvard case. And he also financed and supported the Shelby v. Count, uh, Shelby v. Holder 2013 case that overturned the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the key component of it. So he's done very well as an organizer, as an activist with millions of dollars to spend. Many victories to highlight for him. So going back, and I just found a uh, local writer, Jeff Chang, who was talking about, really emphasized how Asian Americans were used once again to bridge that gap and use in this form of anti-blackness and creating divisions within racial groups. And he says, Asians were standing in as proxies for white students, says Jeff, says Jeff Chang. That's essentially the, strat the strategy that Ed Blum, Blum used. He's quoted as saying, after losing Texas with white Abigail Fisher and the Michigan cases with white students, he said, we need Asians in the case. And he found them. So we will, I will stop there and hand it off. I'm Red, Thank you. Thank you. All right, so this is going to be rapid fire. I know it's a lot of information. Bear with us. I see some of you taking notes, so please do save your questions, comments. We will have a Q&A portion. I will time myself because I do get carried away when I see all of you and it's a topic I'm very passionate about. As a woman myself, as the mother of a 17-year-old and as a teacher for so many of my students. Right? Um, as Mickey mentioned at the beginning, these are issues that affect all of us. This is not just a theoretical discussion, right? This affects us, our families, our friends, and so on. So we are covering small bits of the implications of everything that's happening with the Supreme Court and our Constitution. This is not comprehensive by any means, but we're hoping this will get the discussion started. The first thing I wanted to introduce to you folks is this notion that abortion was not always controversial, right? 
And in my sociology class, I always like to start with the idea of social construction, how we construct concepts, identities, ideas, and those are very much dependent on our historical context, the moment of time we're living in, as well as our social context, right? And it changes over time. So if you look under common law, abortion was uh, pretty accepted before the quickening. Now this is when the woman could actually feel life move inside her. That's what they call quickening at that point of time. And even when pregnancies were terminated after that quickening period, it was just a misdemeanor. So you might start looking at the history and thinking, when was this criminalized? Because before that, literally, there were women who would say, I want to restart my period. That changes the whole perception of what is happening. You see what I mean? Like, I just need to restart my period, right? Um, so what is happening in 1847 we formed the American Medical Association and the young doctor uh, called Horatio, right? He comes up with this notion that, okay, there's a lot of competition that doctors, which are all white males at this point, are facing a lot of competition from midwives, some only women, right? So these were folks who had been helping women deliver for centuries. So what Horatio Storer does is he starts a physician's movement, right? And he says, this needs to be illegal, criminalized. He campaigns on a moral argument that also tapped into the racial fears of the moment. Fears that would eventually inspire a pseudoscientific field of racial improvement and planned breeding of the population, what we call the American eugenics movement. And these racial fears would inspire forced sterilization programs to decrease certain populations where Storer's anti-abortion campaign was trying to increase other populations by focusing on white Protestant women. 1873, Comstock begins lobbying Congress to pass anti-obscenity laws. There had been a rise of prostitution, new forms of birth control like diaphragms, rubber condoms, all of which triggered a powerful backlash, which culminates into this Comstock law. The law made it illegal to mail pornography, contraception, abortion drugs, or even information about contraception and abortion. So they kind of conflate all of it together. And so from 1873 to 1970, that whole century, it's criminalized, stigmatized, but it's happening. For basically, abortions continue to happen, right? And, and that's the basic truth that we all need to kind of digest, right? 1973, of course, you have the landmark Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision uh, that women's right to abortion is protected un under the U.S. Constitution's 14th Amendment. 1992, you have Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which starts to put certain restrictions on Roe and introduces the undue burden standard, right, under which abortion restrictions would be unconstitutional when they were enacted for the purpose of uh, placing a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion of a non-viable fetus, right? Uh, now, the other thing you'll start noticing is that only starting late 70s or so, you see a politicization of abortion, right? And the abortion becomes a big agenda for evangelists. Um, you start to look at the big picture, which is what we professors always tell you, what is happening late 60s, 70s, we have integration. Segregation used to be a big issue, can't have that anymore. So abortion becomes this new focus. And what you'll notice also is that throughout the 90s, 2000s, this gets prioritized in our political debates, in our politics. Even in those moments, it's not very clear uh, along party lines. So you think about our current contenders, right? Biden, Trump, 
they've been swinging back and forth on this issue. Biden, due to religious beliefs and so on, was not as pro-choice. Trump, on the other hand, was more pro-choice. So you see that switching, and you see a lot of this polarization happening where now people are starting to be pro-choice or pro-life based on party lines. That's happening only in very contemporary times, right? So again, I want you to think about how abortion gets socially, politically constructed, right? It's not a given how we feel about this particular issue. So of course, last year, hopefully you've been paying attention. Um, Roe has been overturned. Something that our grandmothers thought that they had fought and won. <laughs> you can't take it for granted. So Roe is overturned along with Casey as well. And what is interesting and telling, I couldn't help but share this with you. Justice Alito's leaked opinion cites Sir Matthew Hale, a 17th century jurist who conceived the notion that husbands can't be prosecuted for raping their wives, who sentenced women to death as witches, and whose misogyny stood out even in his time. Right? That's who he quoted. Immediate effects, right? There were, of course, trigger laws in certain states. And this is, let's see, from June 23, June this year. And you start seeing near total ban in pretty much all of the South here, up to six weeks in some states. And you see, like, this is happening rapidly throughout, throughout our nation. And I wish I had more time to show you the comparison with what's happening in the rest of the world, right? It also gives you some perspective. 11 states have passed shield laws, right? Which can safeguard providers and patients against prosecution from other states because all this is playing out in the political debates, right? That people are trying to get folks even for crossing state lines and trying to get abortion access, right? And you can look more in the goodmarker.org to stay up to date. So most of you understand that there are very grim outcomes. Of course, folks who are vulnerable, who don't have economic resources, um, who are predominantly women of color are feeling the brunt of it, right? Pregnant people who are unable to get safe legal abortions end up carrying the pregnancy to term, experience long-term physical and economic harm. People who seek abortions are more likely to be living below the poverty line, to already have children, and to be experiencing a disruptive life event. All factors that can be difficult when you're trying to care for a child. So folks in the med medical profession are also feeling this, right? So a lot of physicians talking about unconscionable he health risks that pregnant people are facing when pregnancies are turning dangerous. Uh, medical students training is affected, is creating moral distress when they know they can't take the right decisions for their patients. I wanted to highlight also what's happening in California for us. What does this mean? Although it does make us complacent as well. I noticed that in my 17 year old for sure. She's like, I'm in California, hopefully okay, right? But we can, we can never be caught sleeping, right? This, this can happen again and again. So always be alert, pay attention. Don't take our rights for granted, right? So California waters overwhelmingly passed Prop 1 which amended the constitution to explicitly protect the right to abortion, right? Um, and that details it out. This was, this is what needs to happen at the federal level, right? Um, but of course it's installed right now uh, in the Senate, the Senate filibuster, right? And of course we'll share our slides with you. It does feel rushed, but 
I wanted to point out that when all of this was happening, right, it came as a shock to many of us and we started pondering and Professor Ponce already pointed out to you that the constitution doesn't quite work the same way for all of us, has never worked the same way for all of us. Um, and how the Supreme Court interprets the constitution also varies vastly, right, even though it's supposed to be this objective neutral court, supposedly. Post that, many of us are looking more closely and trying to see what does the constitution mean for me, right? And unfortunately, the track record is that vulnerable populations have often not been protected, right? So again, with our topic of reproductive justice, you think about the 1927 Buck versus Bell, some of you read this in your history about forced sterilization of so-called feeble-minded folks, right? That was 20s. You go to the 1974 Ralph versus Weinberger, where you see forced sterilization of two little girls, right? Whose mother is misled. Then you have Madrigal versus Killigan, forced sterilization of Mexican-American women, same story, unfortunately, repeated for Native American women and same story repeated in present times for immigrants in detention centers, right? So this is where I'm trying to also expand our understanding of reproductive rights that think, of course, of, about choice and abortion, but beyond that, right? Um, I also wanted to mention, I know I'm going to run out of time and I want other panelists to speak as well, but Castle Rock versus Gonzalez. This is a horrifying case. That's the photograph there. And this is a case that points out to us that there is no procedural due process claim when a local government does not actively enforce a restraining order to protect its holder. Jessica Gonzalez requested a restraining order against her estranged husband. A state trial court issued the order which prohibited the husband from seeing Gonzalez or their three daughters except during prearranged visits. A month later, Gonzalez's husband abducted the three children. Gonzalez repeatedly urged the police to search for and arrest her husband, but the police told her to wait until later that evening and see if her husband brought the children back. During the night, Gonzalez's husband murdered all three children and then opened fire inside a police station where police returned fire and killed him. Gonzalez brought a complaint in federal district court alleging that the Castle Rock police had violated her rights under the due process clause of the constitution by willfully or negligently refusing to enforce a restraining order. In a 7-2 decision, the court ruled that Gonzalez had no constitutionally protected property interest in the enforcement of the restraining order and therefore could not claim that the police had violated a right to due process. So let that sink in and not much more to say about that. This is my last slide before I hand it over to my colleague. Um, I just wanted to end with this notion of reproductive justice from Professor Dorothy Roberts, a more holistic approach that puts Black women at the center and incorporates their experiences, right? Remember, think about reproductive rights with this broad lens now. How have we perceived Black mothers in our society? All the stereotypes of welfare queens, crack moms, and so on. Right? It's a catch-22. You're doomed either ways, right, if you're a Black mom in this society. It stresses not just the right to abortion, but economic, racial, environmental justice, right? It includes the right to terminate pregnancy, but also raise a child in a safe and supportive community, and it's inextricably linked to our fight for prison abolition, to our fight for the ending of surveillance by child protective services on communities of color. All those issues are connected. So lots to think about, talk about, but for now I will hand it over to Professor James Wilson. Hello everyone. Um, so, um, so I'm 
here to talk about LGBTQ rights in the courts. And I just want to, before I begin, um, just want to acknowledge or just say that I'm an English professor <laughs> that happens to have an interest in LGBTQ rights. And, and I work with a lot of LGBTQ folks here and elsewhere. Um, so it's a personal interest, but I'm not a, a legal expert. But what I want to kind of share with you is where I think we're at and some things that have happened recently and um, some things to watch out for. And this hasn't been a super joyful uh, presentation in general, but I, 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 I want to stress about this situation that it's a, it's a little bit grim. And uh, this is a triggering and very sensitive uh, subject for a lot of folks. And if you need to take care of yourself and step out, I just want to offer that you should take care of yourself and do that if you need to. So um, if the larger context here, I think it's really important um, to think about sort of uh, thinking back maybe about 30 years, um, how much has happened in that time. Um, there's been a lot of gain and progress. 30 years ago, uh, so 1993, I was a young child. It was mostly legal to fire a person for their orientation or gender identity. Um, gay sex was regulated. Certain sodomy was illegal in, in some parts of the country. Marriage was between a man and a woman everywhere, pretty much. And the big advance in LGBTQ rights at that time was don't ask, don't tell, which was a horrible law um, saying, if you don't know it, that, um, you know, you can have gays can join the military as long as they don't tell anybody about it. Um, and also that that was our primary concern, getting gays into the military. Um, so things are better now. Um, we've received a lot of protections from states, from the federal government around employment, housing, other areas, uh, marriage equality uh, has became the law of the land. We'll talk about that in 2015. So some progress, but um, you know, all of this has come with cultural and legal backlash. Um, many rights and protections are under threat around the country and in the courts. I think, I think most people in this room probably know that. There are hundreds of bills right now um, in state houses around the country limiting LGBTQ rights, um, threatening these things that, um, that I just mentioned, these advances that have come, well, all of them really. Um, and the current court with the newer makeup of the court um, seems poised to reverse some of the gains that we have achieved. Um, and this is a really depressing map um, from the ACLU, about 500 bills. This is just from this year so far. Um, the darker purple states are where there are more bills, not that have passed necessarily, but that are working their way through the legislative system. And you can see there's only a few states on there that don't have any color on them. Uh, California does as well. Um, to, to Sangha's point that um, we're not totally immune from these 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 things here. Um, that bill that um, there was just one for California it didn't pass. So so good. But you know we're we're not on an island here. Um, uh oh oh I clicked the link. Where's the Okay. So I want to kind of go through some of these important landmark moments. Um, and the one of the things that um, I didn't, I, I forgot to mention this on my sort of title slide. Um, I, I said human rights versus free speech and religious rights. Um, that's a frame that we'll see a lot right now. And I, and I want to, I want you to consider how that frame shapes what's happening. Um, so that's what you'll see come up a few times here. So Obergefell versus v. Hodges was 
uh, the case that got us marriage equality in 2015. Um, but there was a little, there was a, there was a moment in the uh, opinion written by Justice Kennedy uh, that said, um, the First Amendment ensures that religious organizations and persons are given proper protection as they oppose same-sex marriage. So, in other words, religion is a is an is an okay reason to be in disagreement with uh, this decision. Um, that is sort of vague enough to leave some room for confusion about how this law needs to be implemented. Um, there were uh, at a certain moment various folks in power that were refusing to issue marriage licenses in Kentucky, Texas, South Dakota, and other places across the country because they had a government position and were required by their job to give a marriage license to some uh, gay couple that walked in and they said, no, that's against my religion. It's against my conscience to do that. And there's this famous case of Kim Davis who, who did actually you know, briefly go to jail. It was, she was just in the news yesterday because she was fined $100,000, I think, for damages to the couples that she prevented from getting married. Um, and her defense at that time was that she was trying to exercise her religion and that her conscience didn't allow it and that we shouldn't limit her religious rights uh, you know, and, and sort of holding that up above the rights of the folks who came into her office. Um, another case, uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop um, versus Colorado. This was a sort of test of that idea of conscience rights. Um, the uh, couple went into a um, uh, bakery, asked for a wedding cake, and the guy said, no, I don't do that. It's against my religion. And they sued and, and won their case in Colorado. Um, but then it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court um, kind of dodged the question. They, they said, well, Colorado was, uh, had anti-religion bias, so shame on you, Colorado, but we're not going to rule. It's called a, it was called a narrow decision. It didn't have a broader impact. So we folks, uh, actually, let me, yeah, let me just jump ahead to 2023, because you'll see this is a relatively similar case. Um, folks were kind of trying again. It was the same lawyers that uh, brought the, a, a different case, same state, a uh, website company, 303 Creative, who um, it was a little different because no one asked her for a website, and she never said no. But uh, she knew that if she put, she wanted to make wedding websites, didn't like the idea of making wedding websites for gay couples. And so she knew that she would get sued if she did that. So she preemptively sued the state of Colorado. Um, kind of weird, but that's, that's what happened. And the, the court, uh, the decision that happened this year is that it was a broad, broad, it was not a narrow decision, it was a broader decision, and they ruled in her favor. And the reasoning is about free speech. And that's, um, that's why I mentioned that frame. So the idea is her as an artist um, is going to be compelled to speak in ways she don't agree with her religion. And that argument has become very convincing to the court that free speech is kind of more important than the right of that potential hypothetical couple that might come to her and want a website. And so that, that frame of kind of human rights versus free speech at this moment for LGBTQ rights is a losing one for, for LGBTQ people. Um, I did want to mention a uh, more positive uh, news, which is that in 2018, there was a set of, ca of cases about um, folks who were fired for their gender identity or, um, or sexual orientation in very super explicit, obvious ways. And the court did rule that, this, that the 1964 Civil Rights Act does protect those people and you cannot fire someone for their gender or orientation. So that's good. Um, 
one other thing to mention is um, in Dobbs, which is the recent abortion case, um, Clarence Thomas wrote a concurring opinion, which is not the official um, majority opinion. It's just, it's one that's kind of along the side of it. And he said that the court, um, because of Dobbs and because it was overturning this precedent that had been on the books for 40 years, um, that there were other precedences, precedences that needed to be reconsidered. And there's this very chilling line that got um, a lot of press that uh, made many of us very worried. He said that the court has a duty to correct the error in decisions on gay marriage, gay sex, that's uh, what I mentioned, the court case about sodomy, and the right of married couples to use contraception. Crazy. But, um, and it's, it's one justice, it's not all the justices, but um, uh, there, th this is speaking of impartial, you know, impartial justices like that, we're, one, one wonders, doesn't seem very impartial. Um, so, so where are we now with this, you know, we have these 500 laws working their way through state houses, several that are on the books already, um there's because of this latest decision with 303 creative there are new challenges that are that are always kind of along this line religious rights or free or or free speech you know um does that allow you to to for example fire teachers uh route two there's two religious schools that have different cases about this issue working their way towards potentially to the Supreme Court. And we don't know yet, but that, that's in the courts now. There's another um, case working its way through the appeals process called Bravewood Management versus Becerra, a company that said that federal anti-discrimination laws do not apply to them because their religion dictates that people should be cisgender and heterosexual. So um, again, kind of taking that religious right and elevating it above the written law that's already been ruled on um and then as we as i said at this top um there's these laws being passed in states across the country on trans youth education sports um we're gonna see a lot of cases in the coming years um and then there are social impacts as well um for example um in michigan just a few days after that decision there was a hair salon that uh, put a put a thing on their social media saying if you use anything other than uh, he or she pronouns, you should go to a grooming salon and don't come here like you're not allowed. So so claiming that as a hair salon, they, they took that 303 creative decision to mean as a hair salon, we can refuse entry to you, which is not what the decision said. But my, the, the point is that um, we're, we're sort of validating discrimination as okay, as long as you just feel it strongly enough. And um, there, there's a, a, a huge rise in hate crimes at this time, especially trans folks. And this larger environment is really terrible for all of our well-being as well. Um, so that's the kind of grim state we're at now. A lot of worry. Um, there's a one thing that's out there, this is, doesn't solve it, but um, there is there, the Equality Act has been sort of sitting and been been put forth in Congress many times. This Congress certainly won't pass it, but um, you know, seventy percent of Americans support it. Um, you know, this could this could be codified into law. What it what it does is is take the nineteen sixty four Civil Rights Act and explicitly put um, gender identity and sexual orientation into that law, which would help, um, though not solve everything. So uh, that's that's the, the potential I wanted to leave it on and, and I'll pass it now over to Mickey, thank you. Hello again, everybody. Um, brevity's not a strong point of mine, but I'll try to pretend that's not true right now. 
and wrap this up within the next seven minutes so we have plenty of time to talk class time goes until 2 10. um so i think that, that was uh, that's when we're slated to finish correct yeah. yeah so i'll try to cover corruption in the court in a few minutes <laughs> uh yeah well as all of our esteemed speakers um could have done uh, they could have gone on at length teaching entire courses, graduate seminars on these very topics. My my subject is, I guess, more overarching, and it involves. Oh yeah, you'll also notice. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, I'm not a fan of of doing the powerpoints. I always tell people I just try to make powerful points, and so, um, you know, I, I'm a fan of storytelling, speaking, listening, and so on. Pictures are lovely and nice, and the powerpoints were great, but you won't see. Uh, see that for me hopefully you'll hear them instead um anyway i'm going to be talking a little bit about uh well a pretty big topic you know given that these folks these justices these federal judges right there's not just there's the supreme court there's the appellate system the whole federal court system um these are all folks that in the public eye they 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 are to be uh well upstanding citizens they're they're not just ruling on the law they're they're it's assumed that they follow the law <laughs> Right, but there's a really interesting sort of twist in this that involves the corruption, and that is that these folks are appointed by very ideological actors. Um, they aren't appointed by accident; they're appointed for reasons. In the last couple of decades, there's been a mass influx of money, including dark money, where you don't know where always it comes from, to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars that support people to get onto the Supreme Court. So it's a completely politicized process. Uh, it's one that involves tens of millions, if not more, uh, just in the process of, of selection and so forth. Um, but that obviously then should pry open the possibility that maybe there are some things here that aren't all on the up and up. Maybe it's not a totally transparent, ethical uh, kind of process that we have. Well, step one, of course, I would argue for people who need to be aware of these things, the first step is actually knowing who in the world these people are. Does anybody in this room know who all nine of the Supreme Court justices currently are? Anybody know all nine of them confidently enough to stand up and tell me who they are right now? Anybody? Cool. That's not a joke. It's, it's just to show that we don't even know who some of these people are by name, let alone deed or past or action. So that makes it a little difficult to judge what they're actually doing yes i did say judge the judges because even though we don't get to say who gets on the court we allegedly elect people who represent our interests keyword allegedly uh, and then those are the folks that are entrusted with appointing people to the court i mean if you think about it for just a second it's actually ludicrous that these folks with this kind of extraordinary power lack transparency, lack accountability, uh, the degree to which that they do. So I would say step one, go to supremecourt.gov and find out who these people are. The chief justice was appointed by George W. Bush. I'll let you figure out why that might matter. Clarence Thomas appointed by Bush's father. Sam Alito appointed by George W. Bush. Sotomayor appointed by Obama, Kagan, appointed by Obama, Gorsuch, appointed by Trump, Kavanaugh, Trump, Barrett, Trump, Brown Jackson um, is, uh, was Obama. Um, notice that there are several that were just appointed you know, in the very recent past. The presidents that appoint these people don't just randomly select them out of a bag. And in fact, the people that are in the running are often put forward by other lobbying groups, dark money groups, super PACs, et cetera, that you don't see, you don't know who they are. And the next thing you know, there's a dude up there, Brett Kavanaugh, and he's going to talk about beer and frat parties, and he's going to be a Supreme Court justice, right? There's almost no thought in the general public about where these people came from, what is their pedigree, where do they, what do they do? You know, the last few people that were appointed all came through the extremely conservative right-wing originalist federalist society. That which is very ideologically biased. I'm pointing that out because we are told repeatedly in our society that these people are completely objective. They just, and by the way, don't take my word for it. Take their own words for it. When you see these people in these hearings uh, and you see these people that are asking, they're being asked questions by the members of Congress, um, when asked about their impartiality, 
But Robert said, I have no agenda. My job is to call balls and strikes, not the pitcher back. Barrett said, I don't have any agenda. Alito, a judge can't have any agenda. A judge can't have any preferred outcome in any particular case. Thomas swore that, quote, those of us who have become judges understand we have to begin to shed personal opinions. I don't sit on any issues on any cases that I have prejudged. He must not be human. I mean, how, we must have some extraordinary ability, Clarence Thomas does. Um, well, the problem with these statements all under oath is they're all patently false and they're not demonstrably false. And we can go through all the justices and say these kind of things. Well, why does that matter? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the U.S. courts, the U.S. courts, get this, there is a code of conduct for United States judges. You can go to uscourts.gov and see it for yourself. Canon number 2A says, a judge, get this, an appearance of impropriety occurs when reasonable minds with knowledge of all the relevant circumstances disclosed by a reasonable inquiry would conclude that the judge's honesty, integrity, impartiality, temperament, or fitness to serve as a judge is impaired. Public confidence in the judiciary is eroded by irresponsible or improper conduct by judges, including harassment, hello, Clarence Thomas, and other inappropriate workplace behavior, hello, Clarence again, a going back to Anita Hill. A judge must avoid all impropriety and appearance of impropriety. This prohibition applies to both professional and personal conduct. A judge must expect to be the subject of constant public scrutiny and accept freely and willingly restrictions that might be viewed as burdensome by the ordinary citizen. You should check that out and read it twice a day. And then ask yourself if you've seen anything strange going on in the courts or seen anybody in the Supreme Court that, I don't know, might be in the news because they're going on half million dollar trips with private billionaires that are known masters of dark money funding. Yes, I'm talking about Clarence Thomas again. And his billionaire hedge fund friend, Harlan Crow. ProPublica just did a huge expose of that. They've had a 20 some year relationship at least and we're talking literally about millions upon millions of dollars of various gifts and trips and things lavished on this one justice alone. He's not by himself, of course. We also have Sam Alito. Um, Paul Singer is his hedge fund manager. Get this, Alito was actually hearing cases at the court related to Paul Singer's hedge funds and investments. He's actually getting wined and dined and hung out and donated to by a guy who has cases before the court that Alito hears. Back to Canon 2A. <laughs> An appearance of impropriety occurs when reasonable minds, dot, dot, dot. Well, I know about you, but I'm pretty sure there's a lot of reasonable minds about here. And most of our reasonable minds among us would conclude quite clearly that these people have, well, not just an appearance of impropriety, but they are actually now, our Alito took to the Wall Street Journal to directly argue that these weren't gifts and rich people have rich friends and so it goes. I mean, they're now to the point in the game to where they're not even denying that these things happen. They're arguing that it's part of a political process that's changed over the last century that goes all the way back to the 1880s. That's about corporate personhood and the role corporations play, the role money plays in our civic institutions. So yeah, good luck with me finishing in seven minutes, but I promise to be done in a few. So again, we could talk all day, unfortunately, about this, this topic. But in the last decade plus, we've had a series of, of decisions under the Roberts Court that have vastly accelerated the corporate personhood phenomenon that contributes to what's called the regulatory, uh, to regulatory capture or an enclosure of the commons by private interests, where our own civic and alleged public institutions are so completely tainted by money and run almost solely by money that we the people have almost no say outside of a ballot box where candidates are already selected by that money for us 
in advance. We don't even get to vote for these people on the Supreme Court. And so I, I'm not going to bore you with a litany of these details, but I want to leave you with a few things to consider about even the appearance of impropriety in our Supreme Court. I teach a whole course called Money, Power, and Politics here, and that is at the crux of this story. Uh, supreme injustice occurs when we allow all of these other interests to corrupt what should be a transparent process done in public where the public is aware, the public knows, and the public has the ability to weigh in or to at least understand clearly how decisions are being made. All the work that the people on the courts seem to be doing is to obfuscate that or to blur it or to hide it, or more recently with Thomas and Alito to just rationalize it outright and just say that there's no problem here. Uh, it's a mass gaslighting campaign, essentially, to show that what you see in your own eyes, if you're paying attention, that you would call out in a, a half a second if it were happening in your workplace or among anybody you knew, you would be calling it out as being an example of impropriety, right? And let's remember too that ethics and laws are different things. But let's remember these people end up here judging the laws, and then they, Congress is helping make laws that make their job easier to do in a less transparent way. There is a deeply symbiotic relationship between the money that goes into the political system, Congress that makes laws, and the judges that then conveniently rule on them, like uh, the Citizens United case in 2010 that gave corporations the right of people. Corporate personhood started in 1886 through the courts and it took that long, over a hundred years, but they've got it. And guess what they think? They think that money is free speech. So the more money you have, the more speech you get. I didn't see that footnote on the First Amendment, but apparently the court has provided it for us. And that is something that we need to consider because even though these folks may claim what they're doing is acceptable or legal, we don't know that the rules have changed and the way that Congress oversees the courts has changed. There's only been one Supreme Court impeachment in our country's history in 1805, Samuel Chase. There's been 15 only on the federal courts in general, and only one justice has been kicked off. So when I said earlier that this is a for life appointment, I kind of meant it. And the fact that there's so little transparency or oversight in what's going on with these people is extraordinary. And yet when any media outlet tries to report about it, all the noises come in about how it's not a big deal, it's totally legal, what they're doing is legal, but again, the yardsticks have moved, the goalposts have moved, the baselines are shifting. So what we would easily call out, even under the conservative Rehnquist court 20 years ago, as being a bogus or corrupt issue is now normalized under the Roberts court. But if you don't understand the past and you haven't been following this, you don't know who the hell these people even are, you won't notice. And people like me will sound like raving lunatics. I'm doing a pretty good job, right? because you won't, you won't know any of the information behind it. You won't understand why I'm waving my arms around and talking loudly about this. It happens to be because I think it's very problematic. And all the people and all the demographics that my colleagues were talking about, they're on the receiving end of this kind of corruption and this kind of ideological placement in the highest courts. It must be addressed at its root which is why I am going to finish now by talking about people becoming more aware about the role of money in politics, dark money in particular, be more aware of cases like Citizens United that make these things perfectly legal. Back to the distinction between what's legal, what's ethical. And we go back, look, it's not like we don't have these principles. I was just reading the code of conduct for US courts and judges. They're clearly established. You have to learn about them in poli sci classes. You go to law school, it's like the first thing they're going to smack in your face. And then later you graduate, you go on, you get the jobs, you do the, these kind of things just fall to the wayside. What code of conduct? We make them up as we go. And again, I won't go into the details of the things that people like Alito and Thomas and so on do. These guys make less than $300,000 a year. Good money, good money, but, you know, they don't make the kind of money to be hanging out with the likes of Harlan Crow and Paul Singer. And by the way, ending on this note, another one of our friends on the court, right? Chief Justice Roberts, I'll finish with this. 
His wife works as a high profile job seeking lawyers leading firm. She works with this leading law firm that represents large corporations and government institutions. Many of the lawyers practice on cases that come before the court. She makes a fortune at it and her husband hears these cases. He's the Supreme Court Chief Justice. This was openly reported and zero consequences. There's no consequences for this corruption. If there's no consequences for this kind of impropriety, for even the appearance of such conflicts, then that shows you how far down the road we are into a society that really showcases social injustices, political injustices. Our system is capable of producing different outcomes, but we have allowed it to be turned into an instrument of oppression. And that is the great irony of the courts, is they have the power to interpret these things and the courts should be there to protect rights and expand rights. And what we've seen rather is as they expand rights for corporations and the wealthy, they have begun taking rights away that were from hard won social justice struggles over the 19th and 20th centuries. That is an important point. And I do not want to cede it simply because people have normalized this kind of corruption or are simply unaware that it exists. These nine people make decisions that affect the lives of millions upon millions of people. So I would suggest that if you take anything away from this today, try to pay more attention to what's happening in the political realm in general, but specifically take a look at the, the branch that actually has so much impact and such lasting impact on our society that actually is among the least transparent and least overseen. And we don't really pay a lot of attention to what's going on around it. So hopefully the presentations of our guests today here and some of the things that I'm talking to you about now might spur you to some action to become more aware, more informed. And if you wanna have any kind of sources or any of the materials that I've used or others have used, please contact us so that we can share them with you more directly or sign up for any of our courses. If you're not in our classes, feel free to come by and talk to me anytime about these issues. In addition to teaching here, I run a group called Project Censored that focuses on media, media bias, media censorship. Guess where a lot of these stories about these judges are? Well, they're not in the corporate media or the so-called mainstream press. You've got to look for them because those major corporate outlets are very happy about their new corporate rights and corporate personhood. And so those institutions also have eroding public trust. And it's, a, it's something that's happening across our society. The antidote to it is transparency. The antidote to it is living up to our ethical principles. The antidote to it is not sitting by and just cynically saying, well, what do you expect? There they go again. Oh boy, I'm not shocked. Oh, it was only half a million dollars this time. That kind of cynicism is what will be the downward spiral of our society, of our Republic and the ideals that we've proclaimed to hold dear. So with that, uh, we open it up for any kind of questions, any kind of comments, and I'm more than willing and happy to stick around here after uh, others may have to leave and be elsewhere. So thank you so much for being here today, and we look forward to your comments. Yes.
elementary question about political philosophy, what is freedom? And she says, I am not in a political role. My job is uh -huh. not political, but her literal job is to reinterpret the people. Yeah. And then I asked, uh, another student asks, uh, are you supposed to be representing the public? She says, no, I'm a point. Cynthia Schneider, she can more transparent with me because I'm a private set. So I asked her, do you think you'd be representing the public? She said, no, I was appointed by Bill Clinton. I am representative of my own discretion because I'm trusted with that by Bill Clinton. And I asked her the same question about thoughts of liberty and freedom. And if our government can't be something more to provide people with capabilities rather than just assure them that they won't interfere. And she says, you know, I majored in art history. I think you've studied more political science than I ever have. I'd have to get back to you on that. I'm not sure what you think. <laughs> so that pretty much seals it for me that the bar is super low. The discretion is so consolidated that breaking through that power is just a whole mess that isn't going to work within the system entirely. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks for your comment. That's what we need, more people engaging with each other and engaging with these institutions the way that you did. That's what we all should do. Others, comments, questions, critiques, things to throw? Uh, how do you propose we not necessarily like overnight fix this, but how do we start going in the right direction to reduce the amount of corruption in the courts? Well, transparency is one, calling it out when we see it, right? Um, calling attention to the history of how we got here, even in the la even just in this century has been extraordinary. Um, but it's gonna require reversing those rulings and reversing the rules and laws that enabled them. I mean, that's what we're talking about. And we all know how slow and glacial our larger institutions work and government institutions work. But I don't, I, you know, I, while I may be skeptical that changes will be easily brought about, um, I don't want to be cynical about it because it's very easy to be cynical about these issues, especially when you see the mountains of evidence that comes up that shows that these are calculated decisions that negatively impact people's lives, right? So I would hope that we don't become cynical and that we may be skeptical of those in power, but that we have to find ways to influence the way decisions are made. And look, that's that's the part of the problem with the courts is that particularly when you get to this level and the federal level, they're not they're not really accountable. So there's a lot that needs to be done in order to increase accountability. But I will say one general thing that does tend to get the uh, attention of those in higher positions of power, and that is public solidarity. The public paying attention, wanting to be involved, and showing up at the city councils, showing up at, play, at, at the legislatures, showing up where these things are happening, and reminding their, these officials that they work for you. And it may not be fun, and it may not always be a great afternoon, but if you're not going and doing it, they don't have to respond to anybody. It could be fun. It could be. It's fun <laughs> for me, but I'm weird. It could be fun, right? and, and also, just jump in on Citizens United is yeah. also a target of it's a movement nationally. Citizens United yeah. in 2010, where uh, corporate personhood was enshrined by a conservative court, that's a target of, of activists to overturn that. And that would send a shockwave yeah. to the legislature. It would it would massively impact dark money, money in politics in general. I mean, that's been one of the major problems is that when when corporations were seen as people before the law and money was seen as speech, the court quickly began ruling in favor of corporations and wild spending in campaigns by saying we're just supporting the First Amendment. Um, while they're simultaneously actually suppressing people who are calling attention to what they're doing. So, so I mean, we want to thank you. We want to thank you all. I mean, I just want to let people know. No, we can take a question. We'll be here. I just wanted to say we'll yeah. be here taking questions, but we want to acknowledge and um, you know everybody's time. And yeah. We thank you. We, we know we said we'd over, we'd be over by two ten class time, but you can all welcome to hang out, come up, yeah. and talk to us. Okay. Yeah. So thank you all for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Say, great, great event. Yeah. It's, it's, we're all the hope, right? All of us together. And we'll hang out. You have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Throw it out.